Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in uh, and happy winter solstice. Uh, I'm Mark Christman, Artistic Director of Ars Nova Workshop in Philadelphia. On behalf of the Institute of Contemporary Art uh, and Ars Nova, welcome to tonight's virtual conversation featuring Ashley Clark and Jake McGinsky. And breaking news, a special guest and all special guests will be joining us tonight, the one and only Professor Milford Graves. Tonight's event is taking place in conjunction with Milford Graves, a mind-body deal, currently up at the ICA in Philadelphia until January 24th. The exhibition reopens to the public on January 6th, and January reservations will be available online beginning tomorrow at icafilla.org. That's icafilla.org. Uh, there should be a lot of demand for those, so tomorrow, get on it. Support for the exhibition and tonight's event has been provided by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage uh, with additional support from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the Joseph Robert Foundation. Captioning is available at this program uh, by clicking on the CC button uh, at the bottom of your computer screen. Uh, before I hand things over to our wonderful guests, I want to encourage you to put your comments uh, and especially your questions uh, in the chat uh, on the sidebar anytime. Uh, the sooner the better, in fact. Um, we'll probably have a lot of questions flooding in and we want to try to get to as many of them as possible. So around 7.05 or so, um, I'm going to jump back in uh, and present your questions to Ashley uh, and Jake, uh, and most importantly, uh, Professor Graves. So with that, let me introduce filmmaker and artist known for his award-winning film, Milford Graves' Full Mantis, uh, Jake McGinsky and Curatorial Director for the Criterion Collection, Ashley Clark. Take it away, gentlemen. Hey. Hey. Hi. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm well, man. I'm, I'm here, as Prof would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, first of all, just want to say thank you to Mark and Natalie and Ars Nova and um, ICA Philly, everybody um, behind making this come together. And, and thank you to you, Jake. Um, I first saw your film, Milford Graves, Full Mantis, in 2018 at the uh, South by Southwest Film Festival. And I have to confess something. Um, I, I, I kind of slept on the film a little bit. You, you reached out to me beforehand. This is a story of humility to, to set the tone. <laughs> you, you'd, you'd very kindly reached out to me to kind of put this film in front of me. And, and you told me that you thought I, I would like it. And sometimes when you're a programmer or a curator, you you put off viewing sometimes and you get, you get a little bit behind schedule. And then I saw it was going to be in the South by Southwest lineup. So I thought I'll see it on the big screen. And I saw it and I absolutely fell in love with the film on the spot in a way that I don't think I've fallen in love with, with many films. I could maybe count on one hand. Um, the way that you evoked um, the, the spirit of, of, of your subject, of your, of your, the hero of your film through form and, sound and vision um, without ever being didactic in any way. Um, I just thought it was a beautiful experience. So I rushed down to the front afterwards to invite uh, your film to our festival, only to find that you'd quite understandably accepted an invitation for it to screen somewhere else. It had to be a, a New York premiere. This is all inside baseball stuff, but it was a lesson for me on sleeping on, on, on great work. And I regret that, but we did manage to get the film um, screening at BAM in, in December 2018 and that was a wonderful wonderful evening and I cherish that and if you saw the the, the, the picture that was up at the front um, that was of a, a shot of, of Milford watching uh, some of the film on the screen with a full crowd and how we all missed that today um, in this age of zoom and so on so that's my kind of long long rambling introduction um, just to say what a, what a privilege it is to speak to you and to speak about this work I would I would love to hear personally, coming, coming to you as a fan, and I'm sure people in the audience would, just to hear a bit about the origins of your relationship um, with the professor, how you guys met uh, and, and what that was like in, in the first place to, to feel that influence upon you. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Ashley. <laughs> and thanks for bringing me back to the, those, those, the other times, when traveling and meeting people and and all oh, that is, is like I, I, I sometimes get the, the, the Facebook uh, reminded of memories and it's like we, it gets more and more shocking as time goes on. But um, yeah, the, you know, I was so 
excited to meet you. And I, I, it is true. I, you were the first person I sent a rough cut of the film to. I had been a, an admirer and a fan of, of, of the series you were putting together. And I kind of, I would look at posters like BAM Afrofuturism in film and kind of imagine, could this film be, could this film be like in that world, you know, and like the design and everything. And when I met you, <laughs> Um, at South by Southwest, it was it was the beginning of a really amazing journey. A lot of the stops along the way, you were at too. So thank you for all those those times and festivals and and um, and I I often would would turn to you to try to figure out how to navigate the, the, <laughs> that journey. So um, you know it's really great to be here with you. And um, yeah, I mean, as far as like a, the, the kind of the inception of the film, it's a it's not an easy um, it's a dynamic thing to talk about because it's it wasn't like a story about a filmmaker finding a subject. It's um, I've been a, a student of profs for almost, I think, 19 years now. And the film, you know, is emerged out of that um, relationship. And, and process and in a lot of ways um, you know I can look back to um, first meeting prof which was you know prof may remember I, I, I was kind of waited outside his door at Bennington um, before students were there I wasn't enrolled as a student I kind of presented myself like I came here to study with you and and I was met with the kind of uh, at least for me unprecedented generosity, unprecedented mentorship, um, and the kind of mentorship where the first thing we did was play together. You know, the, it was like this feeling of like someone who was really trying to help me figure out how I was vibrating, you know, how, what I was, what I was about. And that was a different kind of encounter with myself as a learner and myself as a, as a, as an artist um and and this is you know a big portion of my adult life so it's really this relationship with prof is is kind of a formative and foundational relationship and uh, impacts the way i live not only the way i you know make music but the way i parent the way i am in the world um so the film kind of emerged out of of of, of this student mentor relationship and really the first recordings were more just for myself. Um, I was working for prof at Bennington teaching some intro percussion classes and then I was staying up late after prof would teach all of his classes and doing one on one lessons uh, up in the in the attic of Jennings studio at Bennington and I had asked permission pretty early on to record, you know, some stuff on audio cassette, basically. That's one thing that's in this film. There's so many different types of media because that's like my generation was like <laughs> audio cassette, DAT, mini disc, Zoom recorder. It all happened in this period. So the earliest recordings are probably on cassette. You know, then I would borrow a DAT and they were really just for me to, um, process the the conversations we were having because I, I you know after the first couple lessons I realized there was like I would I would remember something that was said or some feeling that was in the room two weeks later you know and then um, I found that I really needed uh, to slow down and have a way to reflect and, and contemplate um, the things we were talking about so I asked permission to do that and then started compiling these recordings. I started, I'm a DJ that's, I've been DJing for, for, uh, you know, professionally for, to pay my rent since I was 18, 19 years old. So I naturally started making like mixtapes for myself and my friends that would interweave profs music and profs voice. And that, that kind of process really is like the foundation for like the way the film started to become a film and not like an archival process or something else was kind of recognizing there were lessons that like if I listened to the mixtape they would just jump out you know um like dang dang a dang um and 
the set, you know, the, the walking across the street um, in a in an asymmetrical way and, and relating that to the heart. I would I would hear that and I would kind of feel myself light up and then and it was really like those lessons that kind of um, kept on staying alive for me that became the foundational um, process of the film. But then there were there were other kind of side windy things along the way, like you know, Prof would have um, an event at Harvard to talk about his garden and and would ask me to put something together about the garden. And then I would, I would kind of do that for him. And then I ended up with, you know, something on a hard drive that kind of had that vibe, like the garden section of the film and could return to it and it had that same content. So it really, essentially, it's it's it was a labor of love that just gained momentum over time. And I think along the way, you know, it's like, I didn't know other people who made feature films. So it wasn't easy to say, I'm gonna make a feature film. It was like other people make those. I'm like doing an archival process. I'm helping out with an event. And, but at a certain point it was like, um, the hard drives were like adding up and they were starting to talk to me and be like, come on, get your shit together. Like <laughs> <laughs> face off with this and, 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 um, I was thinking about that movie, The Bigger Splash with Tilda Swinton. And I think there's one scene where they're driving and um, and he turns to him and says, your closet's like full of hard drives. You know, you're never going to make your documentary. And it was something like that, that kind of weighed on my heart. And um, and then I had a, a residency uh, to make music in Stockholm at the electronic music studio there. And I, I brought the hard drives with me. And they, at that point, they were just, it was like the weight of them was there. And I just didn't do anything with music. I just took 10 days um, and worked on finding structure in the, in the footage. And from there, the film just started moving pretty quickly. That was probably around 2016, 2015. It's interesting that you say there's there's a physicality there that was kind of bearing on you to to make this thing. And I think in, in many respects, something that really strikes me about the film is how it feels like in, in, with, in the best sense of the word. It, it's not from a conventional perspective. It's not a conventional filmmaker hitting certain documentary beats. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit um, about the form of the film, how you came to the edit and how you came to getting into the flow of it, how the film plays. It's so in sync with, with the prof, um, how the film kind of breathes and moves. So if you could just speak at it from a technical craft perspective, how it came together and, and filter that through your perspective of having not made a film before, was that freeing or was that in some ways uh, intimidating? Um, well, I would say in a lot of ways, it, it, it really was intertwined with my work with prof you know so like for example you know i kind of I, the films i loved that dealt with sound or food or, or things that are ephemeral you know like the sensory stuff where the films like you know less blank films like um always for pleasure or um the blues according to lightning or even like the polka film in beer in heaven there is no beer where it's like the film itself feels like polka you know it feels <laughs> like the thing that it's not feels like it in um a sense that it's illustrated but it actually feels like the same kind of energy is flowing um through the film as as the music or you know for example like uh you know the garlic film like it starts to feel like garlic or poem as a naked person just feels like, um, you know, feels like that music. I think um, Prof and I, we would talk about um, things like polyrhythm, polymeter, polycharacter. So you could look at the film through that lens and see lots of examples of the way like sound and image work in this kind of concept of like multiple multiple meters um, occupying the same discrete um, times. Um, and then there's like, like, for example, I mean, I think you can actually look at the film, the lessons in the film are actually the same lessons that were used by me formally to kind of to make the structure. So like, 
if anyone remembers the scene where Prof talks about major and minor scales and their effect on your tear ducts, and and he's he's talking about, you know, that when you have a your parasympathetic nervous system um, activated by yawning or crying or minor minor uh, intervals, you know, the body kind of relaxes, kind of starts to take care of itself, and then if it goes too far. You need to activate the sympathetic nervous system, you know, to, to tense up, to kind of uh, be more alert. And you could kind of also look at the film structurally or formally that way. Like every time there's a feeling of the where you really track, I was like kind of tracking it where the parasympathetic is really activated. The next scene will kind of um, do that. And these are lessons that Prof would give me about musicality, about life. Um, and they're all in the film too. I mean, and even the first quote of the film is kind of both the instruction for me, uh, you know, for filmmaking, but also for the audience, which is look at the room, you know, look at the garden outside, look at the room downstairs. Um, don't try to analyze it. The rest of that quote is, you know, uh, just take it in. That alone will do something to you. You know, you can look at the film through that lens too, of just kind of um, trying to let the footage speak uh, not contextualizing anything in, in, in some sort of um, whatever I wanted it to be, but letting it occupy its own space in the logic of the film. So um, I think all the kind of formal ways the edits work um, are kind of contained also in the lessons that Prof is giving the, the audience in the film in, in a certain way. There's like a kind of um, symbiosis there, or, you know, some sort of snake that eats its own tail continually. Um, and then I think there was like the first cut that got made um, in Stockholm was Prof, you know, is playing in the, um, the 1973 footage and the audience starts clapping, the Belgian audience starts clapping and it cuts to, um, in South Jamaica in Prof's basement, he was standing in front of um, his Ashiko drums um, dancing, but to the, to, the, to the clapping from, you know, 50, 60 years beforehand. And something about that, about like presenting an artist's life, kind of the way, I mean, I'm 44, but I'm already getting a sense that you don't experience your life in some sort of like linear narrative way. It's like sometimes something's alive in you that's 20 years ago and some and it's and it's it's processing through the current um sensation that you're feeling and other times um you know prof will be screaming in the film but the scream will be from the future you know so trying to present like a circular vision of an artist's life and not something uh so narrative or so um straight line linear yeah, so it, it works to really powerful effect. Um, I think you did such an incredible job with that. Um, the film also reminded me, if people in the audience um, want a recommendation, um, in some respects of Shirley Clark's film about Ornette Coleman, uh, Ornette Made in America from 1985, which um, I think is available now on the Criterion channel and in various different places, but I think they're a great double bill and, and complement each other in interesting ways. This is perhaps a good time to segue into that, um, these ideas of revolutionary cardiology and irregular time, the idea that your heartbeat should not be a metronome, you know, you shouldn't be in perfect rhythm, that time is circular, all of these things um, happening. And uh, maybe you could talk us into um, the Bata wormhole clip and just set some, set a little bit of context for that before running the clip. Great, yeah. Um, so, uh, about two years ago, we started shooting 16 millimeter as Prof was building sculptures um, that are now in the ICA, the, the exhibit um, in which this conversation is kind of embedded. Um, and uh, Full Mantis has um, some footage of Prof building the skeleton, which is one of the foundational sculptures that, that, that is in this exhibit. Um, some of these sculptures were uh, exhibited at the Queens Museum. Um, and then Prof made a whole series of other sculptures and they went to Philly along with the, this whole body of sculptures. So check out this exhibit. 
um, if you can. I know there's like curated led tours virtually and then hopefully things will open back up um, at some point. Um, so uh, I went down to document this process. This was after Full Mantis was released. Uh, I was working with a filmmaker named Sarah Lanzalata and we shot 16 in Prof's uh, sculpture studio, which was the dojo, the temple. It's featured in the film uh, where Prof tells the cheese of all nations story. It's also the room where a lot of the Yara um, activity and, and lessons went on uh, over the years. And it transformed into Prof's sculpture studio. And um, in this short film, which uh, was made um, and is playing at the ICA, I think it also played at BAM when you screen Full Mantis in November. Um, it, it documents that process. Um, it's a short kind of poem of a film. Um, and you see Prof uh, talk about the sculptures, talk about the space time fabric um, that connects a lot of the sculptures, uh, the, the mesh wire. And um, the, the, the music in the background is, as you kind of introduced is, uh, the sonifications coming from lab view of Professor's heartbeat, William Parker's heartbeat, a little bit of my heartbeat, all uh, inter, 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 um, intertwined basically as the sound. So it has this um, continual soundtrack of uh, Prof's electronic uh, music. This is, a, you know, like a lot of Prof's work, that sound is music. It's also used in, um, in healing, in his healing practice. Um, he, he also does shows where he plays drums alongside this music. Um, you know, when he played this music back to William Parker, the bass player, you know, William immediately recognized it as um, sounding like his bass when it was coming from his heart. So this is part of what we work on at the lab is, is re electronic recordings of heartbeats and then um, through Prof's, uh, you know, Prof has coded in a, a program called LabVIEW um, a way to kind of create melodies based on the heartbeats and that provides the soundtrack. So um, I'll play the clip, I'll play the film. You gotta see it. You can't explain it. You have to see it. Yeah, I got the whole works in here. When we put all the lights on this here, so all the lights going on. I simulated my research over here. How I'm able to extract heart sounds. From the skeleton over there, you know, the monitors be going on. And it's a lesson in itself. So you don't have to have it on paper. It's gonna be a little extra stuff since I got it in here now put a little more touches to it. I know exactly what to do. Homongolus, you know, they call it the little man in the brain. If you, if you look at the brain, the, the top of the brain, they have the different parts of the brain. One part of the brain controls this area, that area, and that area, and that area, and that so on, so on, so on. So when they, when they draw it, they draw a shape of a man in the brain over there to show where it's located on the body. So I bent it back like that there to show exactly when that thing lights up, you see this, all that stuff floating and blinking and stuff going all around the place there. I said, let me revisit all the stuff in physics and the quantum and qubits and all the stuff that they're talking about. I said, my gracious, man, why are they making it so complicated? Everything they describe, I said, 
I could see that. That's when I went online to see if I could find me some copper mesh. And that's what came. <laughs> that's the space-time fabric. Well, this is going to be, this is definitely going to be the Yara piece. Yara energy. And so this is the energy of magnetic field that would be created around us. Because if you engage in a physical activity, right, your, 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 your nerve energy is flowing. But so there is a magnetic field around your thing. Some people may call it aura or whatever else. But I'm gonna probably take this guy here, I'm gonna take this here, and that's gonna be overland. Uh, another kind of way I'm gonna have that. Yeah, whenever you see the space-time fabric, it always has, it's, it's like in a form of a graph. When you see it gets warped and all that there. And that's the idea, talking about the atom and you know, electrons and the different orbits around uh, electrons. The fabric right there, right? It's like an imaginary mental type of situation. But that mesh can easily go around the head, you know, to create, they have those, they have those helmets. I don't want to put the big helmets on, man, trying to stimulate frequencies. But the only problem is that, man, the, the frequencies is, there's too much constant stuff, I think, going on, man. You know? When they talk about wormholes, somehow they immigrate, they always use this, this, this doggone figure right here, man. The hourglass figure. In the shape of either, either two equal size or two unequal size. I had it here, but the hand was too big. I was gonna put it like three quarters of bata. But I think I'm gonna take a nice little photo of the bata line it back here, to here, to here, there's a bata in. And I cut out the skin I had over here someplace. It was part of the talking drum. I had it on the edge here. But instead of having a string set, I was gonna have maybe some mesh of the wire here to show like the strings, the strings in the tension. Well, the difference in signals and vibration is gonna be through electromagnetic maybe seals that's traveling through here. Uh, but, but the idea is that um, the strings is being controlled by <laughs> how you're thinking, man, how much tension you're gonna put. It's the brain part that's, that's changing that. Instead of, a, a, it's not so much the strings that's changing the tension, it's your thought process. So in nature, man, it's the energy, you know what I mean, that, that, that's changing, uh, you know, like uh, the, the from one state to an, a, a, another particular state. And, and it's similar like a thing, you're gonna go to a wormhole, man. It's a transition you have to make, man. You may be one deity, and one deity could be a whole a, 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 a galaxy, man. And another deity is another deity. So how do you transcend from that deity to the next deity? You know what I mean? The similar to power well universe, man. So when you get stuck one way, you gotta go to the other way. That's what I'm talking about. Because both people, everybody's observing something, man. I don't give a hell where you are, man. It's still, it's still a human, a human, it's still the human brain or receptive, man. And it's that they're receiving energy. Because all those guys, man, all over the world, all the people that done something all over the world, I think you're still receiving, you know, whatever energy's out there, man. We just look different. And we receive it in, 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 in uh, a different kind of ways, man. I feel like I need a, a minute. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. You know, even on the small, even on the small screen, right? Even in in Zoom land, it's like still su super powerful. Um, and you, I think, from people who haven't seen the feature film, you get a sense there of, of how how the film just kind of moves organically and is so in sync with the prop. Um, t tell me about kind of making that that film, putting that together, 
like what 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 was the process like for you um well you know prof was working he said he was working i you know i live about three hours north of of uh of jamaica queens so he let me know he was working on a on a sunday and sarah and i drove down and yeah like the lighting situation was 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 pretty wild in the in the dojo in the temple um and we just made the best of that day with the 16 millimeters so a lot of those lights you see are profs grow lights that were growing plants um and we just shot a day of making sculptures and talked a little bit about the sculptures and that was all the material that went into the film so you you know, you see the grow lights, you see the bata drum kind of deconstructed into the sculpture, uh, bata uh, being both a, a drum for liturgical music in Cuba and also Nigeria. Um, and uh, yeah, it was all all one shoot, you know, one, one shoot, one conversation, and then just a, a collage of that experience. Thank you. Hey, Prof. Hey, good. Welcome. It's so beautiful to see you. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to open up to the audience as well. Please do send through your, your questions here. Um, I don't know if Mark is going to join us as well at this point. If not, um, oh, yeah, here he, here he comes, I think. There he is. Yeah, but I would, why don't, why don't you start um uh with, with with prof first uh while we organize the, Q, the q a sure thing um jake i mean really i i want to it, it's you guys have this beautiful long-term long-standing relationship and you've kept in regular contact you're 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 so close i'd love to to hear you talk a bit about what it was like to collaborate on on bringing this movie into life after having been together for so long and what it was like to get out on the road and watch, you know, for you, Prof, to watch that film with big crowds, to see that, um, to have that experience being back at you. What was it all like taking that movie around? Well, first I must say that um, my first uh, television set I had was around 1950. And, uh, I had an old TV to get about five channels. And I, I was never looked at TV. I looked at everything from pictures about Flash Gordon and you know, the, 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 future, the future space projects that probably would come about. I uh, watched the uh, 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 Tarzan. I watched Sabu movies. You know, I just mm -hmm. you know, I watched uh, all of the Calvary movies. I was a typical guy, you know? And at the same time, I could turn on the six o'clock news and want to be updated. So I came out the fantasy world into the real world. And I'm always, I was always enjoying watching movies. And uh, even when I was in school sometimes, you know, my teachers would make comments. You could really be a great actor. <laughs> you know, you should be in the movies. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to be on the street, I'd be joking with my guys. And sometimes guys would think I was for real and not for real. But I was really in theater. I was practicing. So I was always fascinated at the things that I was watching. And I said, what would it be like if I was in there? If I was Sabu found a, a carpet in the sky, man. You know? Uh, if I was hitting on some drums, man. If I was able to change from one animal to another animal. If it was a guy like, Paws in, swinging from trees. I said, who is this character? You know, and Cheetah was my favorite animal. You know, oh, I used to love Cheetah. So <laughs> I saw all of this stuff. I said, boy, this would be great to be a part of it, even though, even, even though I knew it wasn't real. So, um, you know, times passed by. And then, you know, I went to my, uh, my growing up period, coming up, moving into the housing projects. And I was always around rough characters. You know, if you want to go and play uh, basketball and back with the housing projects, and you had to be a tough guy. Because if you get on the basketball court, guys would always, if you did it, if you, if you made a shot on them, or made a move on them, they want to fight or they get rough. So I had this kind of thing, I was going to be this tough, rough guy because I wanted to play basketball. And then I said, you know what? 
I said, this is all acting, man. I seen a lot of guys act, you know? And so there was guys up there that was big, muscular guys that had these really hard looks about them. And they would have these deep voices. And it was all to psych you out. And I was one of the guys that 115 pounds, 110 pounds. You scared of these guys that 175, 200 pounds that was Charles Atlas muscular guys. And so you would mess with these guys. So we'd have these called sand battles when we get up and we'd be play boxing. Somebody said, Well, this is not for real. I said, It's not going to be a real fight. So we'd be after we play this basketball, man. So we get up there and we'd be like, just act like we are having a fight, you know, jumping on each other, you know, and we catch one guy, open their arms up and hit him in the arms and chest. The rule was, you know, hit in the face. But it wasn't for real. But some guys wanted to be real. But what I learned out of that was because it was not real, man. So I wasn't afraid. I said, this is not a real fight. So all these tough guys, I started beating them up. <laughs> I said, I can beat that guy, man. As big as that guy is. I said, this is all, it's a sight game, man, you know? So after that, I said, you know what? There's something I'm gonna do in life that's gonna be real, man. You know, I was playing all these games of hanging out on the street corners, you know, the wild, crazy stuff. Crazy teenage parties, you know, drinking bad alcohol, you know, doing all the crazy stuff. You're doing that house of crime, what's so-called ghetto, man. And then I had a chance to get out of the housing projects. And I went up to Bennington, man. And that was strange territory. You know, Bill Dixon talked me into taking that job. I wasn't gonna take the job at Bennington, Vermont. Where the heck is Bennington, Vermont, man? You know, when I first went up there to do a concert a year before that, I freaked out, man. We came into, uh, we left to cross the border up in New York State and got into Bennington. I said, man, this looked like a damn land where the Marshals would land. It was so way out. The people looked different, man. They talked different, you know. I said, man, this is a strange place up there. So we did the concert, and then Bill Dixon said to me, look, um, I'm going on sabbatical. Uh, uh, I would like you to, you know, take my spot while I'm on sabbatical. Sabbatical. I said, you want me to do what? I want you to teach in my spot. I said, I don't teach no college, man. What the hell am I teaching college? I'm still talking ghetto talk. Yo, bro, we talk. <laughs> you know, these kids walking in. Hello, professor, how are you? Oh, hello, Mr. Graves. I wasn't used to that, man. You know, I said, these guys look too clean. And nice to me, I'm anything, you know? And uh, so anyway, um, I said, you know, I don't know if I want to do that. So then Bill, I didn't do that job. I didn't, I didn't go to sabbatical. I didn't take his a place. So, but then after that, about a year later, he calls me and said, look, uh, we're going to form this black music department, not division, department at Bennington. The school gave him the okay to form a little black music department. I said, that's, a, that's one of them chunk programs. You know, that's just to keep the peace, man. They didn't want us as a division, but as a department. So I said, I don't go up there, man. And of course it was integrated. You know, we didn't have all this African-American faculty. It was mixed we had. And it was beautiful, man. But, oh, let me backtrack. I told Bill, I said, you want me to teach college? What the hell am I doing teach college? I said, I don't know about no goddamn college level teaching, man. He said, Graves, you're going to get a paycheck. <laughs> I said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to get a paycheck, and I'm trying to play this Latin jazz, all this stuff. I said, wait a minute. And at that time, I had four children. Yeah. I said, I can get a paycheck. I said, well, I'll try it for her. I'll try it. And so I went up to the dean. They said, we'll give you a three-year contract. I said, no, I don't want no three-year contract. I want a one-year contract because I didn't want to have to go through no legal proceedings to get a three-year contract. One year passed by. They said, you want an extra year? I said, I'll try it. And I stayed up there, man. You know, for 39 years, man. And... That was a change in my life from Bennington. I, I met a whole other world of how people think. It mellowed me down a lot, man. It made me feel worthwhile. And, and the thing about it is, 
the kids used to laugh at me. When I first went up there, man, I was trying to dress Ivy League, man. I said, I'm going to college, man. And I had shopping bags full of papers and books. And the kids were laughing. They said, uh, uh, what do you have in there, Mr. Grant? I said, I have a shopping bag with all the notes in there. And I pulled the notes out, and they would be laughing at me, man. And I'm trying to be this college teacher, man. You know, and I always had my Webster's dictionary. So them kids would say, they would be speaking that language, and they would leave out. I said, yes, uh-huh, uh-huh. I pulled my teeth and said, what the hell does that word mean? <laughs> so I got back with a man. I said, I'm going to get on him. You know what? So I started talking. Some ebonics and shit, man. They didn't know what I was talking about. I said, but I'm in charge now. Ebonics is in charge because I'm the teacher, you know? And so we met, man. I met some great, great people up here, and we're still friends. After all these years, man, all these years, man, I made some beautiful friends, families, grand, their grandchildren, beautiful people, man. I said, man, there is another part of this damn country, man, that we don't see, man, that we miss. You know, we denied, man, of sharing our human experience with each other. So, yes, Jake is only telling part of the story. When Jake walked in there, I said, who's this hip guy, man? You know, all the hip kids that come in there and want to do this. I said, we're going to another hip kid. So I said, but I'd be nice to everybody. But then I said, Jake, I said, something real about this guy. Because one thing I can say about being brought up in the streets, man, you learn how to read people. You learn how to read people. I have a I have a friend, man, that we grew up in childhood together. And he was in the house of project, man. He did some stuff that uh uh you know he would have went to a little detention home or something. But we was always guys, man, that we, we did some bad little things, but we never went to jail. And this guy was a great friend of mine, man. We had our little club in the pro housing projects, man. And um, and then we had our little club. Our club was to protect us from other gangs coming into the projects. And so this guy was a real street guy. Unfortunately, see, he never got arrested, man. Never got no police record. So he joined the New York Police Department, man. He was good. He solved the crime that none of the detectives here in the city could solve, man. And I talked about four years ago to the New Union. He said, you know, man, we all come from the housing projects. I'm still me, you know. And he became other high positions. I don't want to say the position he had because I would say who this guy is. But he became very important in the city of New York, national sports thing, man. He was a big guy, man. And I looked at him and said, you know what, man? He looked at me and said, you never thought we'd end up, you know, the way we are now. And all my old people said, man, you guys, man, a few of us pulled out of that, man, got ourselves together, did a lot of self-study, man. But the guy said one thing to me, man. He said, you know what? He said, the law enforcement agency, he said, the street guys can't pull nothing on me. He said, because I grew up in the streets. And all that experience I used to read people, man. And this guy was good. And I said, that's right, man. I said, but we took all that negative stuff he's doing and turn it into something positive. So that's what I'm saying. What I learned how to do is read people, man. Spiritually read people. You know, and we don't need, man, we don't we don't need nobody to tell us who somebody is. We feel that. Because that's the first thing you do when you come from the street. You gotta feel somebody. Or they out to jerk me off or rip me off or whatever else. And it's something, man, is you don't intellectually explain. You know, it's not it's not a classroom blackboard philosophical and psychiatric type of situation that you can derive the trauma from. So that's what I learned, man. So when I saw a guy like Jake, I said, this guy's real, man. The spirit was real. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to give up my time to this guy, man. You know, and we, we can, from our film, if we can, if we was able to act, all the sessions we had, just in our one on one, man. Discussions we had, man. You know, you, I did it. He put out a drum, I put out a drum. I said, let's play. And I, I said, look, I'm going to play a feeling that's coming from within the tradition that I've been like pretty well accepted from. 
And I'm going to give you this feeling. That I know it's the feeling that people told me that I was kind of initiated or accepted because I had the right feeling. I would play this feeling and say, this is the feeling. This is not a blackboard formula. This is not notation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go best, just like I'm feeling this thing. And I'm going to get everything I have. And I want you to get involved with this thing, man. So we had a very powerful situation. But Jake hung in there, man. Then I said, you know what? Jake was going to be my guy. You know what I mean? If I can't do two weeks of the class in school, man, I, I, I said, Jake was going to do it. You know? I mean, it got to the point where if we're going to be frank about the situation, I went on, I had to do something about almost three weeks. And so I told the school, I said, so Jake is going to teach my class two weeks. They said, you're responsible for paying him. I said, I'm not going to be responsible for paying him. You're going to treat Jake just like he's faculty. You guys pay him. And they paid him. You know, I mean, that's how I felt about the guy. I said, he's not no student. Uh, student here. This guy's real faculty, man. You know, and don't give him less than that, man. And treat him with respect, man. You know? So, uh, it goes hardcore, man. It's hardcore. You know? So, uh, <clears throat> this wasn't part of the plan. It's a part of the plan. But along with Jake, you know, my understudy here now, along with Jake, it's, 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 it's Peyton Clinger. You know, this guy's un, unusual, unusual character. When I say unusual, you don't find many people like him and Jake. Well, all my other guys that's here, they've been around, you know. We got a new young apprentice, you know, uh, uh, Martin, that was a student in Bennington, and he's shaping around. But I've been very fortunate to meet people that's real. And like, and if we're gonna get really nitty gritty about it, and that's Mark Christman. <laughs> You know, Mark Christman, man, that guy, you know, when I first met Mark, Mark wanted to set up something. And I said, where the hell is Mark? I hadn't heard from him in two years. And so I said, I went down there and played, and Mark was so decent, man. Transportation, hotel stay, he treated us. And one musician, I won't say his name, said, Mark was like you, because he don't do this for nobody else. I said, well, I don't know about that. I said, but well, I like Mark. When I seen Mark, where he looked at me and smiled over and 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 that that uh, the botany place or whatever. I, I looked and said, I think he has something. I didn't feel no intimidation from him, no anti this. And then when Mark called up to say two of us here, I said, and I must say to Mark, man, I am more than impressed, man, about how he has treated me with respect, man, and dedication. And, 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 he, and he went deep inside to put this, this program on, man. You know, so I can think of many people. And I'm talking about the present time right now. So uh, I don't know. I talk too much over here. Well, that's amazing. Milford, people are, to go back to the film a little bit here. Right. There's, a, there's some people are very impressed with your, with your power tools skills. Um, but you know, a lot of people are curious about the 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 sculptures. Uh, yeah. you, you know, one person, Zane, is curious about transmutation and alchemy in the sculptures. Yeah. Are you are you you know are you thinking about those things when when you're making them? Oh yeah, that's all in there. I went through all of that stuff. I wasn't able to keep, find no gold though. You know, but I, I went through all the studies of doing a lot of transmutations. I named some of my music transmutations, you know? And uh, so uh, I listen to the ancients, man. I want to see if they missed something. You know, I take what they, their skills and what they did and try to see, can we use modern day findings, man? You know, we all, we all, we all experience in the human beings, similar kind of experiences. We just have a different language we use. But as far as that is concerned, oh yes. You know, we, we, we have a lot of work, man. You know, and, 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 and totally what Einstein said, he may have disagreed you know, with some of the ways people were thinking and certain things he didn't want to relate to, man. Uh, but Einstein said one thing was beautiful. He said, we, can, we must change the way we think, man. Yeah, we think the same way. You know, we got to think hard, man. We don't have no problem. We have problems today because we came to a standstill. 
a few people had to back them to think a certain way, and we stopped, man. So if you want to go back, you know, centuries ago, man, and say, because the guy was talking alchemy or about some of the other things, man, uh, especially, I think, even like, uh, in the sense of biological transportation, this literature on that, uh, you know, you got to pay attention. Some people went back and said, wow, they talked about that 20 years ago. This is our answer. So everybody had something, man. But today, because we communicate a lot more, and we share our words with each other throughout the world. You know, I've met some beautiful people, man, that were like, didn't go by uh, asking me if we had a PhD. I, I met some people say, well, do you have a PhD? I said, what do you mean a PhD, man? Well, uh, which school did you go to? End of conversation. Then I don't need you, buddy. Hmm. You will not deal with somebody that comes out the bush wearing feather hats, beads, and bells that may have the answer to something. And they do have the answer. And all these modern scientists, like my friend said, and he went to the deep parts of the of Africa, see all these Western scientists coming there, relying on the so-called primitive or the shamans or the natives, man, to show them what certain things were that they needed, man. Certain elements, man. And how they were using certain elements one way. And the Western guys came and said, wow, we can use it for this. That's, what, that's what's missing. So, do not include that. And to modern day, you know, uh, modern day tools you use, it's an error, man. It's an error. Someone's asking about what's the relationship between qubits and improvisation. Right. Easy to answer. Still working on. <laughs> Still working on. Still working on that? Yeah, I, I don't know. This is something. I can give you some answers, but I don't want to. I don't even know what qubits are. Uh, lesson two. Yep. You're going to get dragged all out, man. You know, you're going into another kind of situation. Yeah. Back. I do. I want to go back to the sculptures a bit. Uh, right. You know, people are asking, you know, did you intend them to be artworks or, you know, functional uh, assemblages? Hmm. You know what? I never even thought of that. Hmm. All I know is that uh, Jenny Jasper, who's the Art Institute in New York, mm -hmm. made the visit because they were putting in a program. And somebody had told her about me. Uh, and they wanted to know, she asked me, I think this is what she asked me, if I could actually. Uh, build some sculpture, art pieces that would represent represent my um, the way I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I listened to her. I have too much to say. The minute when she left, I went to work. I went to work, and I started thinking about everything that I do. I said, I'm just going to put together all the stuff that I do, you know, and, and not try to say, uh, this does this or does that. And then as I put it together, that's just kind of neat, man. You put an acupuncture mannequin up here with a, a, a schematics of a computer with a skeleton. I said, this is some weird stuff, man. So I just let it go. I didn't think too hard. I don't think of it as an art piece, a science piece. I put it as something that turns me on. Mm -hmm. It elevates me to think in a very creative way. And sometimes you got to do it. You know, don't try to put a definition on what you're doing at the beginning. I just like it, man. I just like it. Like, like if, uh, 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 yeah, I'm thinking of my, my grandfather. I think about some of them old guys, man. 
them old guys, man. They be saying, um, uh, uh, I've been doing this for 60 years, and I'm still alive. I said, where for you eat some vegetables? Well, I don't eat no vegetables. I eat meat. I drink alcohol. I smoke cigarettes. What the hell can I say, man? And here's people eating every organic item they had and drop dead in 15 years. I said, something's not adding up, man. You know? So I said, you know, you experience something, man, and if it works for you and it makes you feel good, do it. I mean, after all these years, I figured it out. But I was a fanatic, man. People used to see me. They'd run from me, Mark. They say, give me a piece about nutrition now. Because I was just learning how to do it, man. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I knew you're supposed to be vegetarian and all this stuff, man. I didn't know how to cook. The stuff was horrible. And I'm thinking I'm hip, man. I said, man, but this stuff don't taste right, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I wanted me some hot dogs. And of course, I do eat some, some tofu hot dogs now. You know, I, I'm thinking I'm eating all beef hot dogs. To, uh, you know, I said, but it tastes good. So I said, but you know what's something because it tastes good and it may really harm you, man. But I'm saying, I'm learning, man, that, wow, man. How do we think, man? How do we make judgment? You know, it's not going to always be like sitting in a laboratory trying to figure it out. It don't work that way. And we're going to get back to our gut feeling, man. That's what we have lost, man. Animals got that, man, so great. What's animal, man? Animal don't want something, they won't eat it. You know, they know how to smell, man. If they can look at you, sound like that person. So we got to get back to being animal again. For the control down. Ross, Jake, I wanted to jump in quickly and ask you both to speak about um, the sequence in the film, which I think has been been playing um, throughout as well, um, about the, the Japanese school for autistic children. It's a sequence when um, the children are extremely engaged in, in the drumming performance, and it's a really beautiful and profound sequence. Maybe Jake, you could just kick us off speaking about um, finding that that archival material and, and weaving that into the film. Yeah, um, thanks, Ashley and Derek. You can play that clip um, if you're listening. Great. Um, yeah, in in so many ways, um, that clip was a, a a bit important, such an important part of the process. And, and I think one interesting part of the whole process is there wasn't really a finding. Um, part of the archival nature of this film. Everything that's in the film that's archival are clips that Prof showed me. Um, there was plenty of archival material that he didn't show me. And there wasn't really a research process outside of going to his house. And one day he asked me to bring down a Super 8 projector and to look at some, some old reels. And this reel, which is about 14 minutes long, actually you're looking right now at a clip that didn't make it into Full Mantis. This is where the kids jump onto the drum set itself at the end. We kind of ended the clip with, with their hands and feet. Um, uh, but this, this is what was happening after for, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, so yeah, watching this from beginning to end was like a cataclysmic, cinematic event for me we projected it onto the wall in prof's basement you know in his laboratory essentially it was like i don't know 100 degrees very hot in the basement and watching this it was me my friend marcus who was coming down to film and you kind of enter this footage with this school for um for children with autism and you see all the children, various children having different degrees of, um, you know, response to whatever event that was. There's a lot of self-soothing behavior. There's things like hair pulling, rocking. You see certain kids who seem to be having a harder time than others. And then the music starts and Min Tanaka uh, starts dancing. They were on tour together in Japan. And you see this unfold over time and you watch Prof and Mintanaka finding 
the different pockets of energy in the room and making sure no one's left out. And what you, what you see is a group of people who start in a very kind of closed body position. Um, there's kind of a sense of dis-ease and over the course of 13 minutes, it erupts into kind of an ecstatic um, display of joy and sound and, and movement where um, every student is up off the floor, uh, the teachers are dancing, the students are playing drums. And I just, wa watching this, I thought, if there was a film that could con just put this in something, that this would be worth like, you know, a hundred times of admission to a movie theater, you know, this was like it, this was the, the ultimate cinematic experience for me. So um, I often return to this clip editing. I couldn't cut it. Probably the two hour cut I sent to you had the entire clip because it really was like needing to show the beginning, middle and end of this process of coming into joy, you know, coming into our bodies. And when I talked to Prof about it, he talked about using 12-8, you know, the an, an idiomatic and foundational rhythm of the African diaspora, clave rhythm, and, and laying into that. He also talked about thinking about music not as entertainment, but as like a healing and radiant force of the universe, which was, you know, went with what I was seeing in the imagery. And um, so in, in uh, editing the film, this clip couldn't be touched. It was like, it was like the center of the film, you know, um, this transformation. It was the same transformation I wanted the audience to go through. And it was one, it was a clip I returned to over and over again. I, I was able to finally take some parts out of it and get the film to fit in a, in a, a, a more uh, theatrical length. But, um, but this is the uncut clip. And as you see at the end, the kids are, are on the, on the drum set. And I'm prof can say a lot more than me about it, but for me, this was um, this was one of the great cinema moments of my life. Was this screening in the basement with prof? Prof, you have anything to say about this clip? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, when Mintanaka and his associates said, "We're going to go to this junior high school, and they're going to bring in his autistic kids." It didn't register for me. I heard autism, but we had been traveling around. <laughs> I wanted to relax. And I just heard words. When we got there, when that door opened, and those kids started running in there, I said, wow, this is not going to be easy. I thought the engine of those kids, man. Yeah, I said, this is strong, man. One thing of watching something. So when I see those kids coming in, I said, these kids, man, they're in another kind of way of vibrating, man. And I said, what am I going to do, man? What am I going to do here? I said, I know what I'm going to do. As I'm going to have to get into their group, man. You know, and you know, they always say about sometimes psychiatrists, but they, they'll try to be that kind of spirit that they're trying to heal. And they get caught up and they start to develop an imbalance. And sometimes people like that, you have to get inside of them. You can't be on the outside. You can't sit them on a the couch, you know, with a pipe in your hand and talk intellectual. You have to get inside of them, man, and get more autistic than the autistic kid. Can you get inside of them and come back out? Now, this is the whole thing with say, like, with the, the whole Yoruba people. And these people with the Yoruba, and voodoo, they all got a bad rap, man, which is Hollywood stuff. People look at them like some far way out stuff, man. That, 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 that's just like not real. I said, look, you better get down, man. And you better get inside, man, of that person. That's not easy, man. That's not easy. So I said, I'm going to have to get down inside, inside of these kids, man. And I'm going to have to become like them. And how do I get inside of it and pull them out? And that's exactly what I did, man. You see, for example, I used to watch the way autistic kids would talk. And I said, this sounds like some of the, the singing they would do as I was by music. 
and they have this thing they, they sing out of the throat, man. You see, and the way they they they, they, they anatomical structure the vocal apparatus. So, My name is Salsa. I am that that that. I said, well, man, you know who sounds like that? It sounds like you guys will really understand how to get into the, the, the whole so-called voodoo or Salsa system, and the Cubans they really do it, man. Yeah. And that, oh, my Lupe, oh, my, I see some commercial toys. That's just a shame. Oh, my Lupe, oh, my Lupe, Anatomically, the receptors you have in there connect with parts of the brain, man, that will coordinate you, man, with the whole respiratory system and everything. And a lot of times they do that. When you see somebody getting possessed, man, and the person will get possessed, their eyes open wide, their mouth is open, their tongue is hanging out, and people are chanting, man. You got bells, you got rattles behind you. This is for real. A lot of people don't see the real stuff. They see some movie of this here. If you go to one of those sessions, they can scare you some of the people in there. It would look like insane and solemn, man. You know? But they're trying to make a transition to get back into a normal way of thinking. I've experienced this stuff, man. So when I looked at those kids, I said, man, this is like a way that these kids have gotten into, but using this kind of intellectual system of psychiatry, they don't know how to bring them out. Because they're on the outside of them. They don't get inside of them. That's the toughest thing to do. How do you get them inside? So I started playing, man. I became one with them. I didn't separate myself. And that really was just a number 12 eight. But it's the way you structure your rhythms, you see? And you don't try to be like I said, all proper. You come out of these vocal territories where everything is pronounced in a proper way of this thing. You don't do that, man. And that sends these signals up there, man. Your eyes can roll back up. So I said, now I'm gonna come back in and get into it. And that little kid that stayed in front of me, he wouldn't move. And in the end, they were up. That's when I grabbed a talking drum and got up to set. So y'all take over. <laughs> and the woman came by with men's uh, assistant there. She tried to tell him to leave. I said, let him go. They can tear the drums up, as far as I'm concerned. Because now they're starting to open. And you got to watch closely. The whole thing changed. The way they were walking. And I wasn't on the phone because I didn't have enough film left. But the way they was walking after talking, I said, this is amazing, man. So that's the thing I remember about it. But I had to get inside, man. And a lot of people will not get inside. They're afraid, man. And, 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 and they said, well, how do you get inside? Uh, it's not, well, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. The way you get inside, you have to sincerely, I mean sincerely, want to help. You don't want to help people? It's not going to work, man. You know, you're not doing it because you have been high and you're getting a, a, a salary. It's not going to work, man. It's not going to work because you read a book and the book is saying, well, this is a technique that you're going to use. It's not going to work. You have to cast all that aside and say, I want to help that person. You got to feel for that person, man. You got to become a human being, man. You know what I mean? And that's what it is. And I've only met a few people on the planet like that, that I know, man, that want to divinely and spiritually want to help people, man. And, and that was the key to it. So that was a big moment I see, I see there. And that was only there. I just don't have film of other things. But I've been very successful with that, man. You know, that's, that was that was my whole thing, man. I, I, I've, I've helped people out that had the energy just entangled in the way, man that they couldn't coordinate themselves inside. So they labeled some sort of mental deficiency or mental illness. That's crazy, man. That's another area that has to be overhauled and looked at. We're approaching the damn thing wrong. So there's four, four walls with a textbook and this technique say, it's not gonna work like that, man. First of all, you gotta wanna do it. Don't call, oh, that's a good profession, man. Oh, we can make a lot of money. Or my uncle or my grandpa, my grandma or grandpa, just psychiatrists and, and blah, blah, blah. It don't work like that, man. You got to do it because that's your mission on the planet. 
And unfortunately, we don't have enough of psychiatrists, psychologists that want to help these kind of kids out. That was put on the plan to do that job. It's not an acquired job, man. That's something that you're born with, man. You know. I thought for much as you saw me in Japan, we was doing something together. He said, we talk too much. Mm -hmm. And on stage. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we have to, I have, I think that's a great place to leave it uh, for, for better or worse. I, I think that, you know, if we could only experience the healing arts, uh, like these kids uh, have experienced the healing arts in their, in their lives, um, uh, that the world would be a much better place. Um, so I want to leave it there. If anybody has any last thoughts, uh, feel, feel free. But thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Jake. Uh, especially grateful. And, and um, it was an honor to have uh, Professor Graves here with us today. Um, there's a lot of love coming in from, from all over the country. Uh, that we'll forward to, to, to you guys after this. Um, it was a pleasure uh, getting together. And um, yeah, happy holidays. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so thanks, much. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. see you all.